Um, yeah, thanks for having me uh, and, and welcome everyone. So, um, yeah, we, as, as you are aware, there were, were a few um, issues with the actual speaker, so uh, who's uh, supposed to be here, which is um, Michele Ferrario. Uh, so this is kind of like the first lesson uh, I want to teach you guys uh, tonight. So you know, you gotta kind of be prepared for everything, right? Uh, stuff happens. So yeah, I'm not Michele Ferrario. Uh, you may have uh, heard about this already. There was a, a crash uh, of some uh, uh, air show uh, plane at the Changi Airport. Um, Michaela was uh, in KL, uh, supposed to fly in, um, airport is closed, so, you know, <laughs> uh, that's, uh, luckily he was not on the plane, right, but he's uh, stuck in chaos, so um, that's why I'm here for you guys tonight. Um, nevertheless, so, um, the way, the reason why I'm here uh, is that uh, we're co-founders together in a company called Stashaway. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it um, later in the session. So, um, as uh, Clemens mentioned already, I also have uh, actually a quite uh, extensive uh, background in uh, entrepreneurship. Um, I want to kind of give you a, a quick uh, run through of, of what I've done um, so far in my career. So I started with a, a, an internship at the BCG. That was actually while I was still uh, at school. I studied computer science uh, back in Munich. Uh, did the internship because, I don't know, it was kind of the obvious thing to do. You were, you were just kind of like back then, like it was kind of uh, a, lot of, a lot of my classmates. Uh, did an internship in consulting, a couple of months. Um, so I thought, I'll find out. It was definitely a, a possible career path for me. Um, but then actually decided that I found it um, interesting at part, but then I was kind of missing you know, the actual uh, implementation of what you do, right? You, so what you do in consulting uh, is you, you produce a lot of slides, 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 a lot of PowerPoint. Uh, you can get to, to pitch or present uh, your work, of course, with the clients. Hopefully it's useful for them, but most likely you're not gonna find out if it's even useful for them because you know, uh, they, they basically, you're just not around for the implementation part, right? So um, I then, so by the way, so uh, during my studies, I was part of a, a program a bit similar to, to, to uh, your program here uh, called the Center for Digital Technology and Management, CDTM. Uh, that was a, a, a collaboration between the two large universities in Munich and um, focused very much on entrepreneurship. So you know, there were classes, actually there was part of curriculum uh, classes uh, on building products, on building companies, stuff like that. There were also events such as these, um, and there was a quite active community. So when you surround yourself with a lot of people that have kind of uh, the joint interests of building a company, doing something on your own, it becomes much easier because the hardest part uh, in, in founding a company is actually step one. How do you even find a team? How do you choose who you work together with? How do you find people that you can trust, people that complement your own skill set? So I was in the lucky position that you know I had a lot of these people around me. And so actually, like pretty, pretty soon, so 2007, this was right after school, uh, I founded my first company, a company called WeVade. Uh, and, you know, we were kind of just a team mix out of uh, different, you know, we had a business guy, we had a, two computer science guys <clears throat> and a, a designer. And, you know, the idea was just to, to build web applications to have, you know, uh, kind of a, sort of an agency business and then uh, build a product kind of at the side. So um, I would say the first uh, problem with that was that, you know, we didn't really have a very clear focus as we started the company. I mean, we literally came together saying like, okay, we're going to start something, but then we weren't like entirely sure what that something would be. And it turned out that the agency business that we then did to kind of sustain ourselves, like we obviously needed some sort of income, you know, it starts eating up a lot of your time, right? And so while you think you will have enough time to spend on, you know, developing the actual product, the actual company that you wanted to launch, we ended up not having the time and we spent a lot of time on the agency business. We did start to, to also um, work on a product, but, you know, I guess since, you know, we all came right out of school, basically we didn't have any uh, kind of experience in the industry that we were in, so um, <clears throat> the, uh, product uh, kind of failed, right? So that is sort of the, the second lesson for today. Uh, you know, failure is, is uh, I think, part of the process uh, as you go through, let's say, let's call it an entrepreneurship career, right? Uh, it's failure will be most likely part of uh, your experience, right? And it's very difficult to figure out how to deal with that. So <clears throat> while the company itself never kind of shut down and it was like a big insolvency or anything like that, it was also clear that the company was not set up for success, right? So we had kind of some things we were working on, but the product didn't really take off. And so a time came where I was considering, like, what should I do? Should I continue doing this? But then it felt like a little bit of a waste of time, right? Or should I just say, okay, that's it. Like, I'm, I'm just going to do something else. And I decided to do the latter. So <clears throat> in 2010, I moved to a different city in, in Germany. So the first company was started in Munich. I then moved to Cologne. Uh, I met a co-founder that I actually worked together with during the next uh, four or five years or so. And <clears throat> basically, um, yeah, so it was a very tough decision, right? So again, it was not a clear cut failure where you say, okay, the company is out of business and I need to start something else, but it was more like a decision, okay, I'm gonna leave my current team and start something new. 
So <coughs> we set out uh, to start another company and um, well, I don't want to go into the details of, of everything. It was an e-commerce company, like a, a, a marketplace for baby and kids products. Long story short, <laughs> you can see another family, right? So uh, basically, in this case, it was not as uh, nice. It was an actual insolvency proceedings. A company went bankrupt. We had about 50 employees or so, uh, which we had to let go. So a very, very unpleasant experience, right? Then, you know, I kind of was at the point where I was like, okay, like e-commerce, there was e-commerce. We did a little bit of e-commerce before as well. I was like, okay, e-commerce, no more e-commerce. Like, it's, it's just very, very difficult uh, uh, to, to start an e-commerce company if you don't have the right amount of capital and everything. So then what happened was because, um, and, and that's kind of uh, another uh, sub-lesson or, or how to deal with the failure. So as we were, kind of it was an announcement that, you know, the company is uh, insolvent, business going down. Because of that kind of PR announcement, uh, one of the guys from Rocket Internet, um, you may know Rocket Internet, they're behind <coughs> companies like Lazada and, and Solora here in the region, uh, reached out to us and was like, oh, that's great, like you're a team of two founders, you're e -commerce, uh, you have e-commerce experience, do you want to uh, work for us and start a company for us? So remember, I was like, no more e-commerce, and then Rocket Internet comes, which is doing only <laughs> e-commerce uh, company building. So I was like, uh, okay, well, let's see. Then the next thing they said, again, I was living in Germany at the time, they were like, oh, by the way, it's going to be in Russia. Uh, and so I was like, oh, that sounds, <laughs> uh, well, at first I was just laughing and I thought, okay, that's not going to happen. But of course it did happen. Uh, the offer they made was pretty good. I discussed it with my co-founder. You know, the uh, actual uh, experience that we thought we could get exposure to uh, was super interesting because, well, now I, thought, I felt like, okay, it's not just um, e-commerce, me doing it by myself, but now there's actually a company that has proven. They have in Germany, they had a, a company called Zalando, which was very successful in e-commerce. So but now my mindset changed to, okay, now I can actually learn something and uh, make it happen maybe this time, right? So uh, we moved to Russia. We started a company called Nebelrama, uh, Furniture E-commerce. Again, failed. <laughs> uh, not, not as fast, of course, so we, we started, like it was a long story, like maybe a year and a half, uh, built, built the company, figured out ultimately that you know logistics and especially warehousing in Russia is a very, very difficult uh, endeavor. So um, it's when you think about it, you have a stuff like lot size of like a couch and stuff like that. It becomes very difficult like to, to deal with it in a logistics way. If you think about Russia, if you ship something from Moscow, you ship it like almost all the way to the border of Japan. It's it's a very, very long distances, stuff breaks. It, it was very difficult, right? So and the other company we started at the time was called Westing, so that was a, a second business that uh, Rocket Internet was just investing in, and they were rolling it out in Russia as well. That one was also furniture, but like smaller stuff, accessories and stuff like that. So that one went, went much better. Uh, I put a question mark here because the company still exists. It's not a tremendous, uh, you know, golden star kind of thing, but it's going decently well enough. So we'll see what happens with that, right? Then personally, I decided that I didn't want to work for uh, Rocket Internet anymore. I felt like I was not entirely in the kind of entrepreneurship role that I that I had wanted. Um, that's mostly because the way uh, Rocket Internet uh, sets up companies is it's kind of an incubator, right? They find a founding team, they have an idea, they give you a lot of money, they put you in charge, you grow very fast, but then it still doesn't feel like, you, first of all, you get a, a relatively small amount of the shares in the company, so it doesn't feel entirely like your own company, right? So as I had done the real, the real thing before, I felt like I, I want to get back into that and I want to start my own business again. So uh, I, I ended up uh, leaving uh, Russia and uh, <clears throat> moved uh, to, to the US. Um, that was more for personal reasons. Uh, my wife is uh, American, so we, we, she started a job there, and uh, so we moved there together. And I started a company called uh, Presunio. <clears throat> That's a HR and recruiting software. And so again, even though I put a success sticker here, it was not that simple. So uh, I actually started a company by myself. I wrote the code, um, I designed the product, I recruited the first, or, or, or uh, um, the first five or six uh, clients or so, um, but then, a time came when there was around Christmas, uh, a day before before Christmas, actually it was just on vacation, on, on holiday with my parents. And you know, by then I had one customer, and then that one customer told me, okay, I'm, we're actually pulling out, we're using your competitor software. And I was at a point where you know, I was by myself, I had built the entire thing, and I was like, okay, like that's it, like I'm just like, I'm, I'm gonna stop, like another failure, right? Like you need to see like, hey, something failed here, failed here, failed here, so I was like, oh my God, this is it. Um, but then I was like, okay, now I've already put in like a year of my time, so I might as well give it another shot, right? So uh, then, you know, about two months later, uh, I actually gained the, the, those four or five customers that I mentioned, and kind of it turned around everything, right? All of a sudden, I was busy onboarding those customers, um, and, and, and the company actually went, uh, you know, things went really well all of a sudden. So, <clears throat> um, so basically, yeah, um, I then moved on. So this is, again, uh, more of a 
personal decision that I moved on from that company. I'm still a shareholder, but I moved on uh, mostly because the company was focused on Germany. I was not in Germany, so I uh, instead decided to recruit a, a team of founders that ran or is still running the company at this point. <clears throat> then uh, I moved on to found a company called Divit. Divit um, is an e-commerce analytics tracking company. So um, I basically the whole company was set up in a quite different way. Like we had a uh, a remote setup, so my co-founder was in Sweden, I was in the States, I moved then to Singapore during that time at Divid. Uh, we had a couple of developers across Asia, and so while the company was doing quite well and we had a, we had a decent product vision, I felt like in the founding team things weren't like perfect. I felt like between me and my co-founder, the skill set was not like so nicely distributed. I lacked a little bit of the product vision of myself, and so I ended up uh, in a situation where I was not necessarily looking for something else, but I wasn't like super happy either. And that's actually the time when I met uh, Michaela. So as you know, the, the uh, supposed speaker for tonight, my, my co-founder. Uh, that was like uh, summer of 2016. Uh, at the time, he was still CEO of Solora, but had decided already to leave Solora and um, wanted to start something new. Uh, I was, at, again, at the time, co-founder of Divid, right? Thinking about, like, this is not ideal, but, but nowhere near leaving the company. And <clears throat> he uh, basically uh, told me about this idea he had about Stash Away. I'll tell you about it in a second. Uh, and, and I thought the idea was really intriguing, but then it was like, I was like, okay, but I'm actually like the founder of another company, so very difficult to just say, okay, you know, guys, carry on by yourself, uh, I'm gonna do something new. But actually, uh, I felt like the, the opportunity with the stash away with Michaela, again, because I think the team is very, very important, I saw a lot of potential in that, and so ultimately I actually decided to uh, leave the current company. I, of course, made sure that we hand over everything properly, find a new CTO, and, and, and make sure keeps keep going, uh, things keep going. Um, and then started uh, Stash Away together with Michaela. Here, you know, the success is <laughs> yet to be determined, so uh, let's, hope, let's hope it's going to go well. Um, yeah, so as you can see, like I found it, that's actually company number seven, so I was a little shocked when I created that slide and I realized it's already seven companies. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, that's, that's basically where I come from. I was usually, uh, to give you a bit uh, of my background, I was usually the CTO of the company, co-founder and CTO, um, so handling all the tech, the product, and, and partially also operations. <laughs> so these slides um, are actually from, and that's kind of uh, Nessa number three, are kind of from uh, Michaela. Um, and, you know, the thing is, you know, if you want, want to start your own company, you're going to have to do a lot of pitching, right? We're going to hear some pitches tonight. Uh, you're going to have to keep telling your story over and over and over and over again. Like, to everyone you meet, to any potential investor, potential customer. So, you know, and even though Michaela is doing most, most of the pitching, uh, I'm oftentimes part of the meetings as well, so I know his story uh, by now really well <laughs> as well. Um, so, Basically, um, Michele's idea was the following, right? He was a premium customer with a, a bank, um, and he had, so premium customer means you have a relationship manager, right? You have someone you can call, someone you can ask about issues, someone who will try to sell you certain products. And um, basically, um, you know, he, he was at some point, like, a little bit disappointed, let's say, with the advice that he got. And so he started, like, looking up that uh, relationship manager on LinkedIn, and so what he basically found was, okay, she was uh, actually a cabin crew member just a few years back. Uh, and so, you know, the, you can, you can, if, if you think about that, that person is supposed to give you financial advice and sell you financial products. Um, I mean, nothing is wrong with that, but the, the approach uh, behind the bank selling you products is really that they're trying to sell you products. They do not necessarily have your, your best interest at heart, right? They're just trying to make, uh, make, make sales and, and make a commission. So the other problem is, if you look on the right, <clears throat> you see that's, that's kind of a fact sheet of a unit trust. That, that's a product that, you know, may be recommended to you if you're a customer of a premium bank. And, you know, first of all, the first thing is it's very complicated, right? I mean, you, you can't really tell exactly what's going on here, a lot of numbers and stuff. You know, how, how, do, you, how do you know even how much this product is charging you? It took us, <clears throat> for some of those products, it took us actually uh, an intern from, you know, a business school, taking him like, I don't know, four or five hours to go through all the numbers, everything, create an Excel model to even find out those numbers on the right, which is, you know, the fees are shockingly high. You, pay, you often pay like 2.5 to 5% initial charge and then a 1.75 or higher annual management fee. And those fees are eating up your returns, right? So um, <clears throat> when you look at the next picture, this is an actual example with the numbers from Michaela's portfolio. For unit trusts purchased through a premium bank like that, you can see the returns of overall, let's call it around uh, you know, 17%, were eaten up you know, mostly, I mean, by almost half through the bank's fees. If you think about that, and those are good times, right? But this means actually the market was doing really well, right? But then his returns were, were you know, only like 9.3%. Now, when you think about if the times hadn't been so good, you know, he would actually, the bank's fees would remain the same, but his fees or uh, his returns would, would be zero or negative, right? So the bank's uh, fees are, are actually uh, quite incredibly high. What this leads to is, is a situation, as you can see here, which is 
a lot of people do realize that and they just do not do anything with their cash, right? So if you compare the US where the market is, is quite efficient, you have a lot of products and when it comes to investing, uh, a lot of uh, more advanced investment uh, opportunities as well, there's only 14% uh, in cash, right? When you compare it to Singapore, 36%. Other countries of the region, even worse than that, right? So <clears throat> in other countries, again, let's, let's look at the US, there are better options available. A company here called Betterment uh, is a so-called robo-advisor. Uh, those options were already available in the US. You can see the tremendous growth, right? So uh, you, you can see that they're gaining traction very, very fast. And so the idea was why not create something like this um, for the investors in Singapore? Now again, again, team, team comes first, right? Team is kind of the first challenge you need to solve. So as I mentioned to you, right, Mikhail came to me when he just had the idea, right? So it was just the idea and he knew he was gonna do something but he hadn't really committed to do anything. So he knew he was gonna leave Zolar but he was gonna leave anyway but he hadn't committed to to anything more specific. So the first thing he did was to try to find a team, right? So he found me uh, after we kind of committed to doing this together. Still, we weren't 100% sure, but we needed, we knew some, something was lacking in the team, uh, most specifically the investment background, right? So I have a tech background. Michaela has a background in, let's say, building consumer uh, facing companies in, in APAC. But then we didn't both didn't have the depth of investment knowledge required to build a product like that. So we found uh, our third co-founder, Freddie. What happened after that? You can see here. So things started moving really, really fast. So as you can see, in July, end of summer, <clears throat> we started working together uh, part-time. The company was incorporated in September. End of September, the first employee joined. It was actually a user UX designer, so someone who can build mock-ups and, and design the product. Um, the first tech person joined in November. Uh, 10th of November, we applied for a license with MAS, Monetary Authority of Singapore. End of November, we raised our uh, first uh, seed round, $780,000. 15th of December, we were already 10 people. Most of those people working um, on the product, so engineers. Then in um, about January, February, we did around three rounds of prototype testing with our, with our product. So the first thing, again, we did was just to build a prototype, put it in front of people, get feedback, and then start building the, the tech technology behind it, actually. 10th of uh, April, we filed, uh, sorry, we received the, the uh, in-principle approval for our license from MAS. In principle approval simply means we had the license given a couple of uh, given a couple of uh, uh, things that needed to still happen. One of them being closing of a funding round because there's a one million uh, capital requirement uh, under the license we're operating with. So in <clears throat> end of May we closed a three three, three million pre-series A round. We then got end of May the uh, CMS license from MES, launched the beta version in mid of June, launched publicly a, lot, uh, a month later, and you know by now have thousands of users on the platform already. So. That's in short, kind of uh, where we stand right now and, and how everything happened. So of course, uh, we're, first of all, I, you should take a look at Sashaway itself. Uh, I think it's a, a very good service offering um, that, that we provide for young people, older people, for anyone really. Um, and um, you know, we're also, of course, always looking for talent. So if you're yourself interested in doing an internship, a job after school or, or whatever, um, feel free to apply. Uh, it's, uh, join the team at Sashaway.com. You can find it on the website. Um, and of course, uh, also on the you know engineering tech side, we're always looking for talent. So you know, if you're interested yourself or you know someone, feel free to uh, always recommend. So that's roughly <laughs> about myself. Um, I'm happy to to you know talk about any any questions. Again, it's always obviously a ask me anything session. So <laughs> feel free um, to to shoot. Okay. So at this point, audience members, do not be shy. Um, I have Amelia to my left. She will pass you a mic if you have any questions. So for those who have, put your hands up. Anyone? Anyone has any question? The gentleman on the far side. Uh, hi, Neil. Uh, the question you mentioned. You uh, can I have uh, just? Oh, can I have your name first, and okay. then proceed with your question? Okay, I'm uh, Herbin from the uh, Masters of Education class. Uh, just question about uh, your experience with e-commerce. Uh, you mentioned that there's something that you wouldn't want to go to, uh, go, go back to. What were the biggest challenges uh, you face, and uh, what learnings have you get from that? Right. So one of the problems uh, I face um, at. Uh, at the uh, at the company called Shoparella was um, so we were a marketplace right um, for for e-commerce so we were providing a platform for merchants to sign on and kind of like Amazon marketplace right you have different merchants uh, buying selling uh, stuff so the uh, the main the main problem for us was to get to get size right so meaning um, 
you need to reach a certain size in order for those merchants to become attractive, uh, because you know for them, you're ultimately you're going to be a, a competition, right? So especially the, the smaller shops are going to be very happy because with them you're an additional uh, distribution channel. And you usually don't have enough distribution, so you're going to be happy to 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 take that on, right? Now, but for the the problem is that in e-commerce, like it's very much driven by price, right? So uh, the problem is um, the large and, the, and the, the price usually uh, is dominated by the larger merchants that have you know larger volumes, larger quantities, and therefore get better prices. So um, the uh, the problem is then how do you get those larger merchants onto your website, right? If they're smart, they will realize like, okay, like I'm just gonna create another competitor, so why would I, why would I go onto the platform and support them, right? So it was very, and that was kind of the main challenge, right? So we, we had a very hard time getting these larger shops on, onto the platform. We had a bunch of smaller shops, but then, you know, again, you, if, a lot, uh, that was also the, the market in Germany, a lot was dominated by like price comparison uh, engines, so, you know, people would like, would maybe find a product on your website that they then, they go on Google, check the price, find it somewhere else cheaper, they buy there, right? So very difficult to build kind of this trust relationship uh, with, the, with the customer. I think it's possible if, if you have a, if you find your, your own niche, right? Uh, you, you find something where, you know, you can, you know, you can through content, for example, you can create a better experience overall. You can provide better reviews or better content around the products that you sell than any of the bigger players is paying attention to, right? Because for them, it's just a small category and it doesn't make sense to put that much effort into it. So you can own that like smaller category, right? But if you if you're too broad, then it, it'll, it'll become a size game, right? So that's why companies like sponsored by Rocket Internet, like Zalora and, and Lazada here in the region, they, are, they work because a lot of capital was put into it, right? And that's mostly the success of um, a guy called Oliver Zanger, who's heading up Rocket Internet, and he's incredibly good at fundraising, right? So he was the one running around and like, raising millions and millions and millions and tens of millions of uh, euros for companies that, that existed only on paper. So, he was the one that got like all the capital in, and then it's much easier, right? Because then you you operate on a much larger scale, and it's going to be easier to to kind of go out and, and attract customers. But if you want to kind of bootstrap it, it's very very difficult. And so that's kind of what we tried at Shoparella, and, and it didn't work. So the, the money that was introduced to build the engineering team, or to give this advice to go to come on board at Shoparella. Yeah. Um, the money we raised was mostly for. I mean, I would say maybe. I don't know, call it like 20, 20 percent or so spent on marketing, um, and then the rest mostly on team, right? Because again, in the beginning, you're going to have to build a product first. So what we actually did in that case was we licensed the product from a, a existing company that had a similar business in a different category in electronics and, and videos, which kind of was another problem, right? Because then when you when you license the technology like that, what it does, it, it's nice because it gives you uh, speed, like you can you can launch faster. The problem with it though is that um, it uh, takes away the flexibility to pivot, right? So after, I don't know, let's say half a year, we kind of discovered that, oh, you know, this is actually not going so well. Like, you know, in a, in a, in a normal scenario where we had like built everything on our own, we would probably have said, okay, let's try something else. Let's try a different approach. Let's maybe not do the marketplace, let's do something else. But we purchased kind of that, that were licensed, that, that kind of software, right? That had all this functionality around the marketplace. Now, if you pivot and you don't use it, I mean, you can do that, of course, but like you spend all this money, right? Meaning you diluted your shares, you, you like give up part of the ownership to investors, and now you pivot and do something else. I mean, that, that doesn't make too much sense, right? So uh, that's actually a very important point, very important learning uh, as well, um, to, to just realize that like certain decisions may, may like restrict a lot what you're able and not able to do uh, at a later point in time, maybe a year later. And things can change very quickly, right? Exactly um, the product, how you shape it, it, it may just change over time uh, quite dramatically. And so you should ideally keep uh, the flexibility to do so and, and not limit yourself too early. And that's kind of the mistake that we did there. Okay, next question. Hi, Nino, I'm Andrea. Uh, I just have a question for you because uh, Stashway is a, a relatively new platform and it focuses relatively uh, on a relatively new area of global advices. So what are some ways that you educate the, your current target audience? Because uh, I mean, with like, for example, there are like people in the market who might be a bit hesitant to use this because of like security and stuff like that. So what are some ways that you educate the market on like, using technologies? Right. Yeah, a very good question. So um, that's actually one of the, the key challenges that we're that we're dealing with. Um, so first of all, of course, there's a there's a website, right? So um, uh, you, you may have uh, looked at it already, but like we do have a marketing website that explains the product. Uh, we have a resource center that goes in quite a lot of depth on on, on how the investment uh, framework works, for example, how the product works and everything. Um, then uh, what we um, also do is uh, we have uh, seminars. So we have uh, different types of seminars: beginner seminars, se seminars, expert seminars. Uh, there's also sometimes seminars on particular topics, like an outlook for 2018 now in the beginning of the year. 
And in those seminars, uh, we, we encourage, or it's meant to be exactly for, for people that like find maybe out about Sashaway, but they don't really know exactly how it works. And so they come to a seminar to figure out uh, a bit more. Um, what we've seen though is that it's actually a, a quite large amount of customers uh, in those seminars. So maybe half or even more than half of the audience usually has already signed up, oftentimes already invested, but maybe invested only a small amount, right? Just something to try it out. So the important part about Stashaway is that um, we wanted to make the product accessible for everyone. So there's zero minimum balance. You can literally start investing with a single dollar if you wanted to. Um, so we wanted to make it very easy also for people to, to try out, right? Um, and that is a, a differentiating factor compared to other global advisors also in other markets. Um, and, um, and it had a lot of implications actually on the way we had to design our product. So those were decisions we took very, very, very early on. So in the very early days, we said, okay, we want to make this available to everyone. So that has a lot of implications on the type of license that we need, on the type of technology we need, uh, on the way we design the product and so on. So um, we did that from a very um, early, uh, early point um, to make sure that yeah, if people can just try it out. And, and again, that, that seems to work because people, there's oftentimes people in the seminars that have just invested maybe $100 and then you know, they just want to gain more confidence. Maybe they also just want to see what are the returns like over the first uh, month or two, right? Or even half a year before they commit to a more significant amount of um, savings. I think we have time for one. <clears throat> I think we have time for one more question. And Hi, Daniel. Thanks for sharing. I had a similar question, actually. Um, uh, sorry, can we get your name? Oh, all right. Uh, my name is Anjit. I'm an undergrad at SMU, studying business. Um, so my question is going to be custom education as well. And given that the market is not as educated, uh, two-part question. First part is, what were the signals that sort of told you that this is the right time to enter the market? And second is, how did you identify the lead users that you could bring on uh, to, to, to target as being first customers for special rate? Hmm. Okay, um, so the right time is always uh, very, very difficult to, to determine, uh, right? Because um, uh, the, the way we thought about it was, so actually I can speak from my own experience. So um, as I was with the company called Divid before, it was a European legal entity. So I actually received my money in euros into a European bank account. So I didn't actually have money here in Singapore, even though I lived here already for a year. Um, and, you know, so I never like really like did any research in terms of like how can I invest my money because I didn't have any money here. So uh, when, I, when I first spoke to Michaela and, and he, I was though aware of the concept of a robo-advisor back in Europe, back in the US. Um, and, and so when Michaela first talked to me, he, he was like um, telling me about, you know, the idea of launching a robo-advisor here in the region. My first reaction literally was like, what? It does not exist. Like, because I, I, I didn't know, right? I didn't do any research and I was surprised. Like for me, it was was like, okay, Singapore is this like financial hub, like why, why, why not, right? Like why would a product like that, that is successful, very successful actually in other parts of the world, why would it not work here, right? So um, it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, that makes it easier, of course, right? If you see that there's other markets where your product already works and you compare those markets to yours, again, if you look at, at this, it should work even better, right? Because if you're in the US, you need, what you need to do is you need to convince people that whatever they have already invested, they invested with you. Well, here, the only thing we need to do is in, in keep, uh, convince people to invest their cash that is sitting on their bank account, right? So in theory, it should actually be easier. So those were the things that we looked at. But then, of course, you never know, right? I mean, ultimately, you just need to try and, and go out and maybe talk to people. And so that's the second thing we did. So talking about kind of target, uh, uh, potential target customers, uh, you know, <laughs> Michaela, Michaela was, and actually all, all of the founders, we were all kind of our own customers, right? So uh, I did use the same method of investing uh, before, like when, while I was in Russia, I invested in ETFs directly. Uh, I was a, cu a customer of a company called Scalable Capital back in Europe before uh, I, I started the business here. So I did, I was, exp I was my own customer, right? So I knew kind of what the product should look like. Uh, Michaela the same way, the other founder the same way. And so we, we kind of had then also, of course, a network, right, um, of, of people that, that we knew and that were in similar backgrounds, similar environments. And like you talk to, of course, you, you start talking to them. I remember Michaela had a couple of like barbecue evenings with some of his uh, more senior folks at Zalora. And, you know, at some point you kind of like get the same feedback over and over again. It kind of like, you know, you, you kind of start to realize like there, there is something there and I'm not just making this up myself, but rather, you know, I, I can actually see a market. Uh, the same actually situation here in Pazonia. I was starting the company because out of an own, own problem, right? So I was again my own my own customer because back at, at Mabel Ram and Westwing we were about 100, 150 employees. We were uh, kind of trying to manage all these employees in Excel files and everything, and then it became very very difficult. And I thought, why is there no software solution for small medium sized companies, right? And so I started the company. So I think it's much easier if you're yourself actually your own customer because then. You, you need to still go out and talk to other people, of course, right? Because you'll always have a little bit of a biased view, but it makes it much easier to identify the customers and to talk to them and to uh, uh, think about things and, and try to offer them a solution rather than, rather than just hearing their problems if you're you know, uh, more familiar with the domain and, and ideally would be kind of your own, your own, customer, your own customer of your own product, right? So uh, that, that, that would that definitely help, and, and that's sort of how we, how we approach it. Can I have a question, please? 
I, I'm interested in your career as an entrepreneur and all the all the, the part the arrows you go through. You know, you were hired by Rocket Internet to do some business in Russia. Uh, what do you think were the characteristics that they chose the two of you? Because uh, yeah, I mean, you're so many failed companies. You just all, failed, right? <laughs> yeah. So what was it? What was it about? You know, which is which really interesting for students here. What was it about you? What characteristics do you think you had to make you? Uh, interested to make them interested in you to hire you to continue this entrepreneurship route. Right. So um, it's a very interesting question. So I think uh, you know ultimately failure uh, from my point of view, and I see the same way when we when we fail in any of our companies. When we, when we fail, it's actually the same way, right? It's not like everything is always going well. We we do make mistakes, and I I think mistakes are perfectly fine, and failures are fine. The most important 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 thing is you need to learn from it, right? Um, and and so uh, that's that's what I try to do now. That is probably not what like what made like the the rocket internet guys hire us because like how do they know whether or not we we just fail like how do you know like it wasn't like an interview telling tell me like what what did you learn out of this failure it wasn't like that actually the interviews with rocket uh, with the Oli Sanger are usually about five five minutes long so <laughs> literally <laughs> so he asked me uh, because uh, he knew I was a computer scientist he asked me uh, what what programming languages do you know and I started uh, like PHP I was like okay 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 but are you really good at that and I was like. Yeah, of course. He's like, okay, okay, and that was that was literally uh, the interview, more or less. So, <laughs> <laughs> so about that, I think Oli is uh, really, really good at like judging people very, very fast, and he makes up his his mind, his opinion on on a person very quickly, uh, and he's usually right, surprisingly so. I don't know how he does it, but he's usually right. So, I think coming back to like what's important, right? I think it's super important that you that you are like very, very like persistent, and and in in terms of what you want to do, you. You know, you need to show that, like, you know, setbacks will occur, and you need to show that, like, you're willing to to go through these setbacks and and just keep doing and like be very, very determined, right? I think that's that's a very key quality. If you don't if you don't bring that to the table, it will be it will be very difficult. Um, then I think uh, personally, I think that you know, it's part of, part of what makes a, a, a company's team successful or a company's um, kind of setup successful is is the founding team, right? So I, I felt like it was. Uh, I would have never, never, ever started Sash Away if it wasn't for these two guys. Right? Uh, I, I know that I'm, I have my own strengths, and uh, it's, it's around technology, it's around building a product and, and that kind of thing. But then, you know, I, I know nothing, literally almost nothing. I mean, now I know a little bit, but I, when I started the company, I knew nothing about investing, right? Uh, so, you know, without someone like Freddie on board, it would have been impossible. So, yeah, I think it's important, though, and, and that's not always the case. I think it's important that in the founding team, you have very clearly defined roles, uh, that you know who's responsible for what. Uh, that not everyone is doing the same thing, because then you're going to end up like you know going in circles because you can't like make up your mind. For us, that usually doesn't happen. Everyone has their expertise in their own area, and and of course we still discuss things, but like it's rather you know a, a, a kind of open discussion, and and it's clearly one person that that can kind of inform the others and kind of drive the decision. So um, I think that's very important. Um, you also need to be like not shy to to like do kind of the groundwork and the dirty work, right? So starting a company, especially in the early days. Is not as much fun as you may think, right? So, what you don't see here is like I mean, there's a lot of like annoying stuff. Like you need to like find an office. You need to like I don't know. You need to like file all these papers for getting the co company incorporated. You need to find a an office address. You need to find I don't know. You need to start creating a PowerPoint template. And there's so like many things that that are not listed here. They're not necessarily that much fun, right? Uh, I think it's it's very important still to do them. Um, and 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 for example, here you can see first tech person joins. I probably had. I don't know, 70, 80 interviews till this point, right? So that's that gets like tiring. So when I talk about like telling the same story over, and, and that's at the size where you don't even have a website, right? So it's not like people come to the interview and they know you, who you are, and they and they and they're eager to work for you, right? They don't care. They're like you, you like approach them somewhere on LinkedIn, and then you talk to them, and the first thing you do is for an hour, an hour and a half, you try to convince them that you, they should even take the time to even have go through a proper interview process with them, right? Well, ultimately, of course, still need to do your interview and like filter out the people that you actually think are, you know, good for your company. But so, and it becomes repetitive, right? I mean, if you tell it for the 20th, 30th time, always the same story. So you need to be very, again, that's persistence, but also, you know, willingness to kind of, you know, do whatever it takes and like, and like you know, do kind of the, the dirty work in, in that sense, right? So that's, um, I think, some of the key qualities you, you definitely need to bring. Again, I think it's more important than pure skill set in, in a certain area. I mean, that you can always like learn or like you know for me again I didn't even have like any investing background I learned it like it's not that difficult right but I think it's it's really important that you have these kind of attributes that, that will kind of set you up for for success. Okay, we have one more short question on the left. Hey Neil, thanks a lot for being able to come today and speak. 
Brandon, I'm from Canada as an exchange student. So I guess my question is, you know, a lot of the students here are thinking about, you know, internships, how they want to start their careers. And reading a lot of the about you and Nicole's down and seeing that you guys actually spent some years at some, you know, big companies learning a little bit before starting your own company. We just wanted to know, I guess mainly, what are your thoughts about, you know, going the traditional, you know, route of actually starting an industry and then doing your own startup versus actually jumping straight in, straight out of your bed? Yeah, uh, very good question. And you can see the two examples on this slide, right, Michaela? Is the one who uh, who kind of had the, the industry experience. He was with McKinsey for quite a long time uh, before he decided to then move on to Rocket. And, and, and again, Rocket is not, I, would, I wouldn't call it a pure entrepreneurial setup. Uh, you're founding, you're your founder, yes, but, but I think um, that the real, his founding his own company is now a way, right? So for the most part of his career, he was rather, I would say, an employee rather than a, and a founder. For me, it was different, right? I was, the only time I was actually employed by someone was uh, during my studies as a, as a working student. Uh, and, and, so I think it's, it's, as you can see, I think, I think both can lead you to, to kind of a position where you, you feel comfortable that you're able to found a, a successful company. I think, looking back, I don't, I don't regret uh, what I did, right? So uh, if, I, if I could look back now and say, what, what would I have done differently? It's probably this, right? So as you go like very fresh out of school, it's, it's difficult to, to, I mean, we were all like, like super motivated and we we're like, we know everything and like, it's, this is great. But then, you know, as you come together as a team, we were four people. If you have never like really gathered like actual industry working experience, and it's a team of, of, of only people like that, that makes it difficult. I don't, I don't say it makes it impossible, but it'll definitely be more difficult because you're just lacking a bit of uh, experience, a bit of perspective. Uh, again, here, best example, right? I mean, the only reason I could found this company, uh, HR software, was because I worked in it before. If you haven't worked in it before, you don't know what's going on. And, Part of the reason the, product, the company failed was the product we were building was also B2B product, and we didn't know the market, right? We just didn't know it, and so it didn't work out. So uh, at the same time, I think what, you, what I would probably have done now, looking back, uh, I didn't really have that opportunity, but I, I would do it if I had it now, uh, is, is to join probably a, a startup in a, let's say, exciting role, in a kind of a growth role, where you ideally work directly with the founders. Uh, maybe you can even join as a, as a kind of a, you know, a founder to a team that is already existing, or, or you... Uh, at least join as like one of the first hires, let's say, in, in a maybe, a, and then it depends on, on your field, right, of study, whether that's a more of a generic business role or an or a engineer or whatever it is. So um, I think that, that probably, and, and the reason is if, if you are set out to do that you're, you, on your own, I think that's the best kind of school you can go through, right, because you'll see everything, like as it unfolds, you'll get a lot of exposure. So I think that's, that, that would be, for me, a very good compromise. But of course, you don't always have that opportunity, right? Um, it's important that you're in the right position in that company and that, that gives you that exposure that the company is uh, growing and not dying the next day. So it's not, it's not that straightforward. Um, but, but yeah, I, I do believe a little bit of experience helps. And ideally, I think if you get it in a startup, it'll be much faster because you're just exposed to, to many, many more things than if you were to join a larger company. Okay, okay once again, can we get a round of applause for Nino?